Greetings and welcome back to 303. We are in uh, Senior English A. And we are with you on page 500 of your hymnals. And we are dealing with the third offering by the great poet Ben Johnson. This one is called Song to Celia. And the first thing I want you to do is I want you to write down at level 2B the word lyric. Do you see it on page 500 there in the left hand side? Lyric, right? And then notice the question about what feature of epigrams does Johnson use in lines 1 through 4? And to just make sure to review what we mean by epigrams, go ahead and turn back quickly to page 494. Do you see it? And notice here that you have some bullet point work here, short lines, bouncy rhythms, paradoxical twists, right? So we'll maybe ask about some of these kinds of things happening at 2B. Let's start at level 1. Go ahead and write down the word infatuation. Infatuation. Okay? The idea of infatuation is the difference between lust and love. Many have argued that love must first begin as lust. That is to say, some kind of physical attraction, which then leads to some kind of emotional, mental attraction. You'll remember in our study of John Donne's uh, valediction for bidding morning, the idea that you can fall in love with either the body or fall in love with the mind. You'll remember from Sonnet 116 of Shakespeare, that idea that you can have the marriage of true minds as opposed to bodies. Let's listen to this poem. Of course, this opening first line, one of the most famous in all of the English poetic tradition. Let's read it and just kind of enjoy it. By the way, do you notice already a 2B? You do see immediately that we have a two stanza or two part poem. Very similar, for example, to Still to be Need, right? The poem that we just worked with. Let's take a look. Song to Celia. Drink to me only with thine eyes, and I will pledge with mine, or leave a kiss but in the cup, and I'll not look for wine. The thirst that from the soul doth rise doth ask a drink divine. But my eye of Jove's nectar sup I would not change for thine. I sent thee late a rosy wreath, not so much honoring thee as giving it a hope that there it could not withered be. But thou thereon didst only breathe and sendest it back to me, since when it grows and smells, I swear, not of itself, but thee. Now let's take a look at this already again, the rhythm, drink to me only with thine eyes and I will pledge with mine. Bum, ba -da -dum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. Very intentional, very intentional, this kind of rhythm. Again, this kind of, the adjective that, that, that your textbook uses is bouncy. I would prefer, poetically speaking, maybe the term active rhythm, a very active, very precise rhythm, right? That's going to elicit a certain kind of, let's go ahead and write it down in 2B, jovial mood, happy mood, right? Maybe a little bit sarcastic, because at the very end of the poem, we're going to be told that the flowers that he sent to the girl came back to him, which seems to suggest maybe she's not answering his texts and therefore the subject of the poem itself. Look at the paradox of the opening line. Let's work at level one, shall we? Just brief summary. Drink to me only with thine eyes and I will pledge with mine. Write down in your own language, what do you think he's requesting here? What does it mean to say, drink to me only with thine eyes? Of course, you're probably familiar with the idea that you put wine in a cup and then you toast someone and you hold that cup up to that someone, right? So that's the word picture. But notice what he says. I'm not interested in drinking wine with you out of a cup. I'm interested in drinking with you with only our eyes. In other words, what's he actually requesting here? Yes, he's hoping that he could just sit and look at her. That is to say, drink her up with his eyes and she will drink him up with her eyes. It's a very interesting activity at 3B. And after this poem, I've had some seniors that take me up on it. To sit for five solid minutes. Use a watch, stopwatch. Five solid minutes with someone you really care about and don't allow your eyes to deviate. Some have called this a lover staring contest, but the idea is for five whole minutes, not a word spoken, 
nothing, it's silence. But all we're gonna do is just look in each other's eyes. Let's see how that feels for five minutes. This is what he says he wants. Why? Again, we'll go back to the word you wrote down at level one, infatuation. He's totally infatuated with this girl, Celia. He would like so much to be able to just look into her eyes and have her look, just look at him. Look at the next one. Leave a kiss, but in the cup, and I'll not look for wine. In other words, he says, I'm not interested in wine and exchanging drinks with wine with you, but I'm very interested in a kiss. Now let's pause for a moment at 3A and make a quick observation. This reminds us, doesn't it, of the moment Romeo sees Juliet. Remember, it's an interesting two-part dance. First he sees her and he says, oh, she doth teach the torches to burn bright is code language for I've never seen anyone so stunning, so hot is the language we use today because of lines like that. But then the second part is he walks directly up to her. Even today, at a dance today, most students will report that if a complete and total stranger just walked up to you and says, I want to kiss. Even today, I mean, that's 1600 when that Romeo and Juliet roughly is, is, is shared. Even today, all these years later, most students will report, whoa, 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 that's just a little bit too fast and a little bit too frontal. We need a little bit more words to be spoken. Here, notice Ben Johnson playing the same game. All I want is for you to look at me. All I need is for you to give me a kiss. The thirst that from the soul doth rise doth ask a drink divine. Let's put it in our notes. He says, I'm so thirsty, but not for drink. I'm thirsty for the real divine drink, namely, of course, love. This, of course, is playing all those games that the Greek poets love to play with, right? The idea that the most important drink you ever, ever have is the drink that can quench the real thirst, which is, of course, the thirst for what? love, right? But might I of Jove's nectar sup? Jove, of course, the, 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 the name of, of, of Zeus, the great, the great god. I will not change for thine. In other words, even if I could drink ambrosia with the gods, I would turn it down if I could drink you up with my eyes. Uh, now, some readers of this poem will say, dude, a guy will say absolutely anything to get the girl, right? Notice the break. It's almost like the break is necessary because of what he says in the second part of the poem. What does he say in the first part of the poem? Hey, I just want to be with you, just with you. Which does beg a really interesting question. We wrote down the word infatuation. Should we also write down the word obsession? Let's write the word down anyway and ask if you make distinctions between infatuation and obsession. And then we'll ask, is love by its very definition, true love, obsession. That is to say, totally into this one person. Look at what we find out though in the second, which is kind of now going to be the ironic twist. Look what he says. I sent thee late, that is to say recently, a rosy wreath, right? That is to say, I sent you some flowers. Not so much honoring thee as giving it a hope that there it could not wither be. The irony. We think about this. I mean, I said this around our famous Valentine's Day. Let me get this straight. I love you so much, I'm going to take something alive, a flower, I'm going to kill it, and I'm going to stick it then in water and give it to you as a symbol of our relationship. What once was alive, I've killed so I can give it to you on Valentine's Day. To which obviously the response is, no, 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 you don't understand. The love that's represented on Valentine's Day by flowers is a symbol of beauty that once was really beautiful and then of course after you kill it, it withers. Note the irony here. He says, hey, I cut the flowers and sent them to you. Not so much because I needed to send you flowers, but I was hoping that if the dead flowers were around you, they'd come alive and stay alive. They'd never wither. In other words, you are the source of all kinds of eternal life. <laughs> Notice, but thou, you, thereon didst only breathe. 
and sendest it back to me. Well, let's write it down at level one. He sends her the flowers, and what does she do? She sends the flowers back to him, right? Since, notice he says, though, when it grows and smells. In other words, he says, I got the flowers back, and I smell the flowers. I didn't smell flowers, last line, not of itself, but thee. The only thing I smelled was you. Thank you very much for sending the flowers back to me because I know you breathed on them because I can smell you through the flowers. Level one. Now we know what the poem is about. It's a song to Celia. Let's work at level 2A. What do you want to say is the primary message of a poem like this? How do you read a poem like this? Do you read this poem as, for example, complimenting this woman? Or in some ways, ironically, basically saying to her, hey, come on, don't send my flowers back to me. That's kind of rude, right? Do you see this poem as an act of obsession? That is to say, almost borderline insanity, which does beg a really interesting question. Remember in the play Hamlet, that when Hamlet starts acting like he's crazy, Ophelia comes, Ophelia is Hamlet's girl, Ophelia comes to her daddy, Polonius, and says, my boyfriend Hamlet, completely nuts. Oh, remember, Polonius says, I know what's wrong with Hamlet. He is love sick, love mad, lunacy related to the Luna, the moon. The idea is, and the Italians had written actually quite a bit about this, guy sees girl, falls into love, cannot have girl, goes completely nuts and loses his mind. It was a legal, actually medicinal kind of understanding in 1600 that a guy could actually go completely nuts because of love. Interesting. Do you think this guy is mad? Is he in love or is he in lust? Let's jot that one down at 2A as a possible message. Is there a distinction between the two? When a guy goes after a girl, what is it that he really seeks? What is it that ultimately he really wants? Is it the greatest, most divine of drinks? Of course, 2B, We've already pointed it out. The genius of this little poem, notice its rhythms. Notice the ideas of the break between the two parts. In other words, he says, hey, this is what I want, but this is what I got. You return the, you return the flowers back to me, but that's okay. Of course, we'll think about at 3A some funny lines. For example, in Dumb and Dumber, remember when she says, if you were the only guy left on the planet, I still would not. Then he says to her, what does she say? If you were one in 10,000 or something, and he says, what, back? You're telling me I've got a chance. That famous rejection is acceptance if I understand it a certain way, which does beg some really interesting questions about at 3A. What is your favorite movie about the girl rejecting the guy? What is your favorite movie about the girl ostensibly saying to the guy, yeah, no, nah, it ain't going to happen, and how he then has to respond to that? What is your favorite song about rejection and about the girl shooting the guy down because the guy definitely wants to be with the girl and the girl just shoots the guy down and says, yeah, not going to happen? Let's go to 3B. What are your thoughts about this poem? Do you think that a guy who is totally into a girl, can ever really get the message. So for example, she says to him, I'm not interested. And he goes, you're responding, which means you're interested. If you weren't interested, you wouldn't tell me to go away. You would just totally ignore me. So she goes, okay, I'm gonna totally ignore you. You're totally ignoring me, but I understand why. You're conflicted, you really are into me, you just can't accept that yet. If I continue, if I come at, Guys, of course, always ask this question, so let's write this question down and you try and answer it. When should a guy know it's over? When should a guy know it's over? He gives her the flowers, she sends the flowers back. Should he know it's over? He says, no, because she breathed on the flowers and then sent the flowers back to me because she wanted me to smell her perfume. And I'm smelling her perfume, which means she obviously is totally into me. But guys, do not get the hints. Is that true? And do you think things have changed somewhat in our culture? Or is it still kind of the same way? Guys want the girl, desperately want the girl, try to contact the girl, 
she doesn't respond and he goes, oh, she's just, she's just wanting me to continue to try to get to know her. And so I'm going to keep sending her texts. I'm going to keep sending her flowers, etc. Very interesting. Hmm. Well, there you go. Song to Celia. I hope that you maybe enjoyed a little bit Ben Johnson's work.